it's just so wrong to go. That you just did. You know. Why does it not work? It doesn't. I don't know. It's like the same reason why do you not double the third in the first inversion chord? Because it sounds bad. That's all that matters. It sounds bad. Science, you can ask you if your kids ever say, well, why? You go, well, it's science. And they'll go, science? Well, it's this overtone series. You go study that. Go study physics and acoustics. But mostly, it sounds bad. And it sounds bad, generally, to make a giant leap one direction or the other and then not turn around and go the other way. And I can't really tell you why. Um, um, Henry Mancini's. He goes up and comes back down. Uh, and yeah, he, he does it every time. Let's see. Uh, another big jump. A jump of a uh, major seven. But it, it's super singable because he brings it back. He, uh, he goes out and he comes back. He doesn't go out and leave you hanging. He goes out and comes back. Uh, okay, so those are the... I mean, literally, I've just summed up all the rules of melody writing right there. Um, but now, let's talk about some practical stuff. Uh, it, assuming, there, there's two ways you can write a tune. You can write a tune with no words. You can just write a tune to write a tune. But a lot of the times, if you're writing to words, how many of you write to existing words when you, when you write a, a melody? All right, you have, an, you have a responsibility to make those words sing well. That's, that's really way up there on the list. Uh, if, if you write the world's most beautiful tune and the words sound wrong to it, you fail. Uh, keep, keep the tune, write another tune, set, set that tune aside and find the right words for it. But so emotionally, when you approach a melody that has, you've got a set of words to deal with, the first thing I try to do is, is go, what are these words saying? What is this about? What is the emotional content of these words? That, that, that helps me uh, with the tone that I select. Listening yesterday in uh, the, how many were you guys in the reading session, the composer favorite reading session? Uh, uh, I felt like... Uh, there were two or three pieces there that I was going, oh man, uh, Heather, uh, Heather's gotten real good at this, at uh, really um, uh, absorbing the emotional impact of the words and, and, and putting it into notes. I felt like that, and it, what, it was in another, th oh, it was in the, the youth concert, Elaine Hagenberg's piece, uh, and I've sung it in choir, uh, what, I'll, I'm blanking on the title now, but uh, hers, you're going, oh, she totally nailed the emotional impact of those words. You need to look at it. You've got to go, what's the emotion of the lyric? What are the peaks and the valleys that are in the words? Because they may guide your melody. Also, where are the rhymes? And do the rhymes have a rhythm pattern to them? Like yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday, all my trouble seems so far away. Um, now I know it's here to stay. I mean, if somebody gave you a lyric that was that well shaped, those words are going to help shape the tune. If if you don't if you don't honor that kind of uh, the, the 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 melodic power of the words, the way they're 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 phrased, then you're missing the boat as a tune writer. And then you get you also ask yourself, where are the opportunities to text paint a little bit? You know, now you can overdo text painting, I think. You know, but uh, you know it's if you, you know. The falling leaves, you know, that, that's fun, but a little bit goes a long way. Uh, I'm really big on the importance of setting words rhythmically correct. Now, have you guys know the word scansion? Do we know that word? There's a, it's, a, it is the, the way that words fall rhythmically, the natural stresses of words. And a poet or a lyricist, it's real important that if you're, you know, that, that, emphasis, that you, you don't put the emphasis on the wrong syllable, as my mother told me. And um, so if somebody has, you're writing to an existing set of words, you want to follow the natural rhythms of those words and the natural emphasis of those words as best you can. Uh, I have a real problem with Jesus, the name that calms our fears, the hymn. 
you know. Uh, that was one of those classic cases, I think, where the tune existed and then the words got written and they just got slapped on top of it without any regard to the fact that we don't say Jesus. We go, Jesus, that's the way you say this name. And there's, there, you'll see a handful of those in a hymnal from time to time, but we're, I think we have a, if you're writing tunes to words, you have a high responsibility to make those words work. And so do not put, you know, land your strong beat, uh, you know, your downbeats on the or some, some word that just doesn't matter. You look for the natural stresses. Read it out loud. Read the lyric out loud. Where does the natural stress happen conversationally? And try to get the music to fall to that place. Uh, and uh, I would also say be very careful about melisma. Do we know what melisma is? You know, the using uh, more than one note per syllable. Uh, in choral composition, you can, you can do more of that. I, it's, but if it's too busy, uh, that, that wears really hard on the ear. And if you're, the, more pop, the more you approach the pop world, the less melisma you should use, despite the fact that that's what R&B singers do all the time. But the, the melodies aren't written that way. You know, they're just doing that as the vocal gymnastics they're doing. Uh, I, my whole approach is to try to write a singable melody. Uh, and this means you need to know the limitations of the singer for whom you're writing. Uh, my, one of my first collaborations, uh, long-term collaborative <coughs> relationships I had was with a guy named Chris Machen. And Chris is a terrific baritone singer and uh, he tended to write, when he wrote melodies, he tended to, he wrote for himself, and he has this massive range, you know, and, and then I also wrote a lot for Luke Garrett in the early going, and, uh, and he has an even more, had an even more massive range. But then, if you're writing for uh, the average choir singer, you've got to keep that in mind and go, uh, you know, an octave and a step, you know. Uh, for your bathroom baritones, you know, the guys that are kind of singing bass, you know. Uh, or if you're writing a hymn tune that you want everybody in the congregation to be able to sing. Keep that melody, keep that range, pull it in. If you're writing for, uh, are you writing for an amateur singer or a professional singer? Are you writing for a male singer or a female singer? Is it a pop singer or an opera singer? Uh, you know, uh, very few people have a two octave range. A functioning two octave range. Um, the reason the Star Spangled Banner is so difficult to sing is it's it's rangy. It's an octave and a fifth, I think, or octave and a fourth at least. And uh, uh, I remember. Do you know? You remember the the song "Shout to the Shout to the Lord"? You know, my Jesus, I love thee, Lord. There is none like you. Written by Darlene Check. And, uh, and then it gets to this chorus, and it's shouting along, it's way up there. And I, I, I just did, had, was only vaguely familiar with it. It had already been a huge song, and I just hadn't been paying attention. But I, got, I had to do an arrangement of it, and so I did an arrangement of it. And, but it was a solo feature, and, uh, and it kind of has to be, you know, because of that range. But I hadn't really thought about it, and I had the, arguably the best, girl session singer I've ever worked with in my life in the studio. This girl's just unbelievable. And she looked at it and she said, oh God, not this again. <laughs> and I said, what, what's the matter, Lisa? And she says, it, it just wears you out. It just beats you up and wears you out because it, and she's right. You either set that opening so low that no one can sing it so that they can sing the chorus, or by the time they get to the chorus, they're stripping their vocal cord out. And what's ironic is that all it the check needed to do was go, my Jesus, I love thee, Lord, there is nothing. You can just go right up the scale and shave that, it was shave a fourth off the bottom of the song, I think. And then you can set the key wherever you need to. And so years later, I did another arrangement, and I did just that. I was going, everybody knows it by now, I'm going to do it different. So. <laughs> uh, but know, your, know the limitations of your singer or singers. But a lot of great songs, Moon River, I play a little bit of that, Heart and Soul, Over the Rainbow, these which is maybe the best song ever written in popular songland. It's a, a range of an octave. That's it. And Judy Garland built a career on it. Here's one way to test them: sing them yourself. Now, if if you're Chris Machen, I guess you you know you can go. I can sing it. And I say yeah, but nobody else can. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, make them singable. Now let's talk a little bit, I'm talking really fast because this is an hour and a half class that I generally teach and I've got an hour to do it, I think, right? What time is it right now? It's 3.13. So you have about 20 or 25. Okay, we're, we're okay. I'm, I'm, if I keep talking fast, we're good. Let's talk about harmony. Because writing a melody, okay, again, back to, uh, where'd it go? Valley High. That's interesting enough in itself. But when he goes, it's that harmony that, that just, you go, oh my gosh, you know. Uh, you know, it's one thing to write the tune, it's another thing to be able to harmonize it interestingly. The more proficient you are with chords, the, the, uh, it's, I put it this way, what's, what's better to color with, the box of crayons with eight colors or the box of crayons with 64? You've got a lot more things you can do if you've got 64 chords as opposed to eight chords at your fingertips. Or in praise and worship land if you've got four chords because that's all they use. I mean, I'm not kidding. I'm not even kidding. It's like I'm, uh, it's the one chord, the four, an alteration of the four, a little bit of the five, the minor six, and sometimes the two. But I mean, it's it's like you know, just uh, it's just and the, you put the one, the two, and the five, and everything, and, and just move the bass around, and that's you've got a praise and worship song. But uh, it, this is the corollary to a, an author having a big vocabulary. You know, um, matter of fact, there's an author named Madeline Lingle who wrote uh, *Wrinkle in Time*, but she has a fantastic book. And if you're if you're just interested in reading about faith and creativity, because she was a believer, she has a book called *Walking on Water: Reflections on Art and Faith*, mm -hmm. and it's one of the most quotable books I have I have written songs based on lines in this book. The, her observations about creativity and faith are amazing. And she has one in there. She's going. We don't. Uh, we don't think. Uh, we don't have words because we think. We we can think because we have words. The more words you know, the more clearly you can think. It's like it, you. It, you're not just. If you've got a hundred words, you can think this clearly. If you've got ten thousand word vocabulary, you can think like this. It's the, what separates us from. You know, I mean, they can teach a hundred or so words to a dog. So that's, your, that's all this dog can do, you know, he'll understand them. It's similarly with harmony, the more harmony you understand, the, the deeper and the more clearly you can think. Even if you're, even if you're limiting yourself to triads, at least you know why. And so, uh, it's Stephen Sondheim, before him, he says, if you only know three chords, you're going to write three chord songs. That your music's going to be three chord music. That's all you can do. Now, in, in Nashville, there is a famous saying in Nashville, country music is three chords and the truth, because so many country songs, I mean, Hank Williams and all that, it was just the one, the four, and the five chord, that's all they ever did. But I'm assuming, and, 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 and there are a lot of great songs that have been written with two or three chords, you can do it. But um, it, it's, if you're going to write sacred music, I would encourage you to learn a little bit more than that. Um, there are multiple substitutions and alterations for every chord there is. Even if it is nothing more than taking a plain old C chord and adding a second to it. And suddenly it has a different tone, a different texture. It sits there and, it, and, and it's a different way to harmonize and it also implies another melody possibility. So suddenly, if in the key of C, you're going to, you can start the melody on the second tone, but you can harmonize it with the one chord. And that's just going to, and it's creating tension and release, tension and release, but knowing that you can, because if you saw, if you just saw the D on the page in the key of C in a music theory class, you'd go, oh, it needs to be harmonized with the five chord.
tone, right? Different attitude, totally different sound. And it's about knowing, hearing it, knowing what sound you're wanting to achieve, and knowing that these chords, uh, uh, knowing enough chords to know how to do that, you know? How, yeah. how would you recommend getting better at it? Studying other people's music. Uh, when I was in high school, I had quit, I had quit taking piano foolishly when I was nine. You know, I took it from seven to nine and quit. Now, this is boring. And, uh, but I wanted to be a drummer, and I, so I was playing drums in high school, and, so, and then I discovered a certain kind of music that I was, I didn't listen to much, uh, a lot of the pop music at the time. I was listening to some big band stuff and some jazz things. And so I got real fascinated with the idea of what is this guy that, that they'd say arranged by? What does this person do? And so I started looking at it and it's going, oh, they did. So I started getting sheet music and learning, just going through actual sheet music and playing through these famous songs. My mother bought, my mother was a singer. She was a really good singer. And she had these uh, collections of, of famous songs with playable piano parts that I could kind of figure out. And so I started learning what, oh, so... You know, it wasn't, uh, I see. Uh, what, but I, I remember learning Let It Be. I, I, could, I could read that. I go, okay, that's, that's C chord, that's a G chord. Right? And you start doing that. But then I was listening to like Blood, Sweat, and Tears, which was that jazz rock band in the 1960s and 70s. And they were doing this chord. You know, going, what is that? I mean, what is this chord? That is the coolest sounding chord I'd ever heard in my life, but I had to go buy the sheet music to find out what it was, and see it on the page, and put it under my hands, and learn it. And that's really a great way to do it, and to uh, and work with, uh, look at standards, get a book of, of Rodgers and Hammerstein songs, and and look at those these sometimes they're unbelievably simple, and then he just does these crazy surprises, these little chromatic chord changes that you go, oh gosh, why didn't I think of that, you know, and you'll start to get those under your hand. Another one that I remember seeing years, another guy showed, you know, I saw it in one of his songs where he was literally putting the three and the four in the same chord. I mean, I mean, let's see if I can get it, yeah, it's like, he was crushing, and I was going, that doesn't, that can't work, and yet it did, and then the other one was the sharp Sharp 11, which is now just everybody is totally comfortable with it, but it's you know, it's this chord, you know, and it's this, you know, this Leonard Bernstein used that a whole lot, like in West Side Story and stuff like that. And you and you start hearing those and you learn them, and you go, Oh, it's associating something you can see with something you can hear, and it's and it'll soak in your brain. I think of that that way. Uh, Here's a few parting tips. I'm gonna, we're going to look at a song, uh, the a lead sheet and everything. A good melody should hold up without its lyrics, uh, but and also a good melody should support and fit its lyrics. All right. It's important that it support and fits its lyric, but it should sound pretty good without the lyrics. Uh, it should be evident in a good melody where the title goes. Uh, the, or the hook line, yeah, you're gonna the title and the or the hook line of a song is uh, one of the most important things. And and you know even choral anthems have hook lines sometimes. And it's it's where that important melody goes that people are going to remember. That's where you need to put it. A good melody is singable by a normal person. Uh, a good melody we've talked about this is memorable. And here's this elusive thing. I think that a good melody has something in it that's unexpected and even, if I dare say, a little magical. You go, oh, I just didn't, didn't hear that coming. And um, a good melody is often the result of perspiration as much as inspiration. Back to Sondheim, I heard him tell a story about Jerome Kern, who wrote All the Things You Are. And, uh, and he said he was... I, I think he, he told us if he was in the area, I mean like in the next room while Kern was hammering this tune out. Because you know, Stephen Sondheim was just a kid hanging out with all these people because uh, Oscar Hammerstein kind of adopted him, you know, uh, as a teenager. 
And so he was hanging out with all these unbelievable people. And he says, uh, he heard Jerome Kern working on this tune, and he was literally hammering through it and trying every possibility for a certain note. He's going, da 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 no, da 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 just hunting until he knew what was right. And Sondheim's point is, if, if Jerome Kern was willing to work that hard, he says, I, I need to be the same. And, and the other is, don't be married to anything. Uh, you've got to, uh, now, uh, we've got an alumni of my songwriting teaching in, in Atlanta, and they know that my whole mantra is, writing is rewriting. You're not done when you put the pen down the first time. That is your first draft and you're going to go back over it, you're going to fix things, you're going to change things, you're going to rewrite things, you're going to change notes. Uh, I, my melodies sometimes take a long time to hammer out. Uh, Maurice Ravel Ovel said the best work I ever did was with an eraser. So that'll tell you something. So, uh, I want us to listen to a tune. I think this lead sheet, St. Joseph's Prayer, is it attached to your thing? Yes. Okay, we're gonna listen to this demo. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this. This was a tune written to a set of lyrics. Uh, I had the set of lyrics. I got it from one of the guides. It's a, one of the registrants at, the, at Joe Martin's uh, Composer Symposium in Atlanta, where I teach every year. And he had submitted these lyrics, and I really liked them, and I asked him, could I try to work with them? And I made some alterations in his lyrics because it was more of a through-composed thing when I got it, and I, and I turned it into a song thing. But the first thing I had to do was look at it and look at it emotionally. So this is a, a lyric we've all seen. Uh, we've all seen songs like this. It's written from uh, Joseph's standpoint. He, here's this man who's about. He's a, he's the father of this newborn baby, and he knows this baby is the you know the Messiah. And this is a heavy, heavy burden to carry. And it's this weird place to be emotionally. Here is this baby who he's going to be the father to, and yet. Here is this baby who is his creator. And so I thought it was a really interesting set of words, and, 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 it's, and, it, and it became a character song for me. It's, I wrote it almost as if this was a character in a show or in a musical, so that I wanted it to be believable. So it's, you can't do anything with it chorally. It's a solo. It's the only way you can do this song is as a solo. But I just was really touched by the words, and so I wrote it out. And then uh, my friend Luke Garrett, right before he died, uh, we were in the studio working on something, and I threw this lead sheet in front of him. I had done the piano part. I said, quick, this is Luke, but he is literally sight singing. There's, it's this one take from top to bottom. He just sang it down, and, and he, was, he was that good a reader. So I, I was going for it to be vulnerable, but it had to have a sense of strength at the same time uh, later on. Uh, I, I wanted it to feel very real and believable. And so that, and, and because it is a man expressing his inner thoughts, it needed to be, uh, I, I wanted it to sing naturally. Can we press go uh, before, before we run out and we'll just listen to it now. And we can talk about it. And, and you can look at the shape of the middle. That's why I was going to go get the mask back so that we could turn it off. Oh, okay. So just give me like two okay. seconds. Keep right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's what that was. Okay. Playing a second ago. Why is it not playing now? Oh. Yeah, everything's kind of gray, isn't it? Computers. If I, I've got it on my phone, but I can't. It won't play loud enough in here for everybody to hear it. Um. So I mean, you, you can look and you can see uh, the opening. Phrases are very, uh, a lot of, it's small moves and repeated notes because it's almost like he's talking. Um, and, and you see a lot of that, that it doesn't even, the first real leap, uh, you've got uh, fathers have done this, you see that, uh, and uh, baby, my savior, that's kind of an answer to that. And I do a, a key change, which means that you can sing from this note, to hear. You'd never want to sing that at bar 18 to bar 19 without the help of the harmony underneath it. The harmony makes it very easy. You can 
hear it once you hear the chord. But is that that start? I mean, a, a tritone. I wouldn't recommend writing that without helping it out a big, big time in the uh, in the harmonies. Let's see. I'm using a common tone modulation, guys. Uh, we figured it out. I got a mouse. Uh, a mouse, a mouse, a kingdom for a mouse. Oh. Is that not going to work either? <laughs> Please work. When in doubt, hit, try escape. See what escape does over there on the keyboard. That doesn't help, okay? See, the mouse we borrowed earlier, they yeah. were like, we need our mouse back. And I was like, I need it for like three seconds. Is that the same one or is that a different one? It's not the same one, it's a different one. Well, uh, you can't even you can't even activate anything because it's like that everything's grayed out. Where is the one we had before? Do I'm I need to go beat it. somebody else? I'm gonna maybe. Yeah. I'm not gonna beat anybody else, but if it's Brad, I'm bigger than him. Questions on anything I've said so far before we look at this? Have I been so good, or have I been so hopelessly, you're going, I'm so confused, it doesn't matter? It all makes sense? Have you, have you all gone, I've heard this a thousand times? No responses at all. <laughs> Robert, if you want to do this and it doesn't get going, I'll be to try to sing it if you want to. We may have to, although I don't know that I can play it. We're going to see. I don't know why that one would be any different. <laughs> What's weird is it, it's like, oh, wait, yeah, now yeah, she's got it. Oh, good, good, good. good. Nice I got it, All right, right. Well, good. All right. You can turn it up if there's more volume.
And I mean, there was a time, I worked it up one time. I, I, I mean, I, I took piano at college here and went to level five just to get good enough. And I can play piano in a rhythm section where I'm staying out of the way, but I have no technique. Uh, and, but I tell people I don't play the violin and I know how to write for the violin. And if, we're, if you're a composer, you, you know, you don't sing soprano, but you need to know how to write for a soprano, which is different than writing for a bass singer. And, um, and so um, I, I don't have much of a better explanation than if you can hear it, you should be able to write it down. Um, now, I, there, you do need to write within the limitations of an instrument. Uh, violin has limitations, flute has limitations, all of them have their own unique limitations, just like singers do also. And uh, so you need to know what those are. And a piano, boy, I'll tell you in church music, the limitations of, of a of the piano or mostly the piano player, you know. When you hear uh, Steve Roddy play or Joe or any of the fantastic players that are here, uh, I, I, I don't, I try not to write at that level a lot because if you do, there's a lot of people that couldn't play it. Uh, so I have kind of a rule that if I can play any two bars of my accompaniments, then, then a, a decent pianist can connect them all together. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think you can do a lot with, I mean, the, uh, looking at Dan Forrest, uh, watching him play yesterday, uh, he had a couple of challenging moments, but really they were lovely piano accompaniments, and they're, and they're not a thousand notes on the page, you know. It's picking the right notes that matter, and so a lot of it is just hearing it. you got to hear it. It's, uh, you got to hear it in your head before you even sit at the piano at some, to some degree. And that takes time. It really does take time to train your ear like that. Uh, uh, I, I've gotten to where I sometimes try to write away from the piano. I particularly start songs that way. Uh, and then I'll finish them. And then the piano will guide me sometimes. But the problem with writing at the piano, if you play well, uh, you're going to, your hands are going to lead you rather than your ears leading you. And you want your ears to lead. Uh, whether it's melody or the harmony choices. I mean, because it's just so easy to fall down to a comfortable key and go, oh, that feels so nice, I like those chords a whole lot, and that your hands just start doing what's comfy. And I think, that's, I think that is what is happening, quite frankly, with a whole lot of praise and worship songwriting. These, there are young people that are writing these that they literally only know five, six chords, if that. I mean... Or the same, or they know four chords in three keys. So I mean, you know, and they don't know any other way to come. And so, and their hands are doing everything. They just start strumming, and then they start singing to that, rather than start by listening and going, "Here's a melody that's really cool." Now let's, because it's also rhythm based. Everything's so rhythm based. And uh, I mean, and I'm, I've got a lot of songs that are rhythm based. I mean, I really do. This is not one of them. This was a melody based thing, but. And that's fun, but, you know, it doesn't generally, you don't in, generally end up writing really compelling tunes like that. What is some uh, sources of lyrics? Like, what do you... you mean to write to? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a lyricist also, so a lot of my stuff, I do myself, and I just lucked into this guy's work. I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, do you like write it, a poem? If you're writing your own lyrics, do you write like a poem and then the music? Or? No, uh, this is going to sound, uh, uh, I don't mean this to sound snooty, but a lyric and a poem are two different things. But I know what you mean. Uh, yes, I have written plenty of lyrics first and then sat down and written the music later. Uh, uh, I, when I write lyrics, I write to a very specific, I, I hear a rhythm in my head that I know will sing. I often even have a tune in my head when I'm writing it. And even if the tune changes later, uh, it still works. If you know, I, I know it will sing, and I know that it has a form and a shape that, that works. Matter of fact, I have written, you know, probably a dozen or more songs where I wrote the lyric, and I wrote it to a tune in my head, and uh, uh, handed it off to another person, Reggie Stone, and I've written several songs together successfully, and and never once has the tune that the other person wrote even remotely resembled the tune I heard. Mm -hmm. not, e not even close. And yet, they worked. 
because the lyric was had a form. So you're not a lyricist, so where do you find lyrics? You either find yourself a lyricist, you know, somewhere that somebody you know that can write lyrics. You can if what kind of music do you like to write? Oh, I'm just a novice. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to write pop stuff, you need to find um, the problem with old poems and stuff, they don't, they don't uh, convert. It, now, if you want to write, uh, you know, serious choral stuff to it, those old texts can be set to music sometimes. But I, I, I encourage you to be uh, willing to change them to make them sing better if you need to, if you need to rewrite things. I have rewritten uh, hymns. Uh, uh, I just did a thing with uh, Jesus, your boundless love to me. I, like, I, I love that lyric. But I, I took it and started with that and, and turned it into a new piece of music. And if you looked at the original hymn lyric and my lyric, you'd go, yeah, I can see this is a result of this. But it, after the opening line, it takes its own thing. I borrowed ideas from it and the shape of things and, and a lot of the concepts and turned them into my own words. I did the same thing with an old song by Charles Gabriel called uh, My Prayer and turned it into a song called um, A Little More Like You. Um, the Psalms, I've gotten lots of good ideas from that, but, um, but you may need to be willing to change the words if it's an old ancient text or something to make it more singable. What are your, sorry. Go ahead, well, here, we'll go here and there. Okay, um, it has to do with um, how complicated the the left hand. Uh, um, what I've found is when I'm playing something as a pianist, you tend to fill in stuff, and then I would listen to it as I had played it, uh, recorded it, and I said, a lot of that is just fill. Yeah, it's, it's real easy to overwrite. So, um, what do Less you do? More. You figure you figure out a um, pattern of some sort that's a, a consistent with the song. Uh, yeah, yeah, and <coughs> and just be careful about just it, consonant eighth notes can just become wearisome. Are we okay on time? It's actually you're a little over, but you okay. can you can finish up answering questions. All right. Uh, well, yeah, I and mean, if you need to split and go to you know something, go ahead. Okay. Your, your I'm fine. I'm just making sure. Okay. I was Thank curious you. here if I did of utilizing uh, poetic meters uh, when you're writing a text. Just, at least for me personally, I, I think of songs like Oh Crazy Me has a really strong poetic meter, which I was glad to see come back in pop music. You know, uh, I cast my mind, no doubt about uh, that. You know, it, it still follows that, that true that, that true practice. What, what are your thoughts on that uh, utilized today now? I don't think much about that kind really? of stuff, really. I mean, I mean, having been a drummer and a percussionist, I mean, rhythm is always in my brain. Even on this song, which is a ballad, you know, uh, the way I phrased his stuff, where I mean, I was always very aware of it rhythmically. But I don't think too much about, you know, uh, the legit kind of side of, of the poetic thing. Uh, we. Lyricists borrow a whole lot from poets. You know, we borrow all their, we steal all their, uh, their, their metaphor, their synecdoche, and all the all the tricks they use, all the poetic tricks, uh, tools that they use. Uh, but a lyric is always something that's meant to be heard. It's not to be, it's not, it exists to be heard. It's not, it doesn't exist to be read on a page. That's, I mean, it can be, but the real point of a lyric is to be heard. And, and, and my acid test is, can people understand it when it's sung and does it fit? I mean, so I, I may be, uh, it may be an informal way of doing what you're talking about, but I don't, I do not get lost in those weeds, you know. And, and you could, it's easy to get lost in those kinds of things, uh, but that's just me. Well, even when you read, you know, legit poetry, right. uh, the, the, the challenge is to breathe life into it and, and not make it sound like poetry. Right. You know, to, right. To kind of find those places well, where you can kind of break the rhythm. The interesting thing the, is you know, that meter. you know when you read poetry, 
you, you, you often read it to sound more like prose. Right. But when you sing poetry, it sounds more poetic because it fits a rhythm pattern. Mm -hmm. And the rhymes land because the music lands the rhyme. I just said, uh, the, I, uh, Randy Edwards, who, you know, he did the youth choir thing, I write music for them from time to time, and he said, we want to have a dramatic reading of Kipling poem If, you know, and I need an, orchest an orchestral bed for it. And so I had to read it over the bed that I created, and you realize that Kipling wrote that, and all the rhymes are very rigid, but if you read it where the phrases were, it, you, all of a sudden that that bump a bump a bump a bump goes away, mm -hmm. and it sounds much more languid. And uh, but if you were to set it to music, it would all that bump a bump a bump might come back. It's interesting. So in a weird way, setting a poem to music actually makes it more rigid because you're locking it down. You're locking it down rhythmically. Also, music seems also legitimizes or helps to legitimize. Uh, near rhyme a little bit better too. Oh, absolutely. You know, just kind of absolutely you know, because the music, the music rhymes. Music rhymes. The music rhymes. Absolutely. The phrase I, that's I, that's uh, if you're setting lines that rhyme on the page, that's that's what I was getting at earlier. It's really important to make sure your music rhymes at those places too. Yeah. That it, that that there are mirrors, you know, musical mirrors that that you go. Oh, those lines connect. Not only do they connect musically, they connect. Uh, orally with the words. Too. So, what would you? How would you incorporate that rhyming music? Well, I mean, it, uh, back to uh, back to Sir Paul McCartney. Yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. He's rhyming that musically, mm -hmm. in that it is the exact same shape. He's just doing it on different pitches. Yeah. You know, it's it. Now, who knows? I mean, as a songwriter, he may have. I, I'm fairly certain he came up with the tune first. The eggs yeah, yeah, it was like I, he famously had some nonsense words to it, and 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 so it's kind of this is about melody, and so I took the assumption that you had words. That's about the only way you do it. But now I wrote a song uh, that Joe. I had Joe Martin write lyrics for it. Uh, uh, Shepherd of the Stars. I don't know if I can remember how it went. It's like. Was the beginning thing? It's this really beautiful kind, of, but I just wrote da 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 da. Yeah, I mean it was it was like the tune. I had no words, none, zero, and uh, I sent it off to him, and it took him two years, but he finally wrote <laughs> words for it. And but it's really hard for a lyricist to do that. It's very very. I, I've done both, and I think the most difficult job in songwriting is to write an original lyric to an existing melody. It's really hard. <laughs> And uh, it's easy. It's easy to write a tune to a lyric. Although I know a pop music, that's a real popular way of coming about it. Oh. The ghost writing or shadow. Well, it, well, what it is, it's in pop music. They're concerned of what makes a pop record a hit is the music, and it's often the track, as more than the melody. And so pop people will literally write what is they think is a hit record musically. They will create this track with instruments and everything and then figure out how to write words to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael W. Smith works that way. Michael W. does not write words. And he, but he, he writes songs singing dummy lyrics to them. Because I've written with him a couple, three times. And you would get the track from him, and it's like, yeah, da, da, da. He's, he's just kind of like syllables that almost sound like he's saying something. It's like he's, you know, like singing in the spirit or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, but what, what that's telling him is if he can sing the melody with syllables that aren't even words, then he knows it's a singable tune. And so then the lyricist has to write to that. And it's really hard. And it's, and now, I, he is, I've written words that he set the music for a youth musical, but he wrote a song for Point of Grace on a record called My Utmost for His Highest. And uh, uh, he, they had the track done. Everything was done, yeah. Yeah, they're telling us to leave. But everything was done, and I had to write lyrics to it. And, and I was like the 10th person that they tried, and I finally got it, you know. But it was it's brutal to do that. Hey, guys, thanks. I'm glad you came.